You can hear that from your side in the booth. No. Okay. Oh, so it's too long. Too. Because my Zoom's not on. Your Zoom's not on. I don't think my Zoom's on. But it's gone. But now it's actually gone. That feels good. Okay. So we oh, can, great. Thank you. Yeah. It's always down to the line. Can't wait to yeah. hear you saying. I know. It's a... <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Annika, can you actually sit here so all the panelists are sitting in this front bit? Yeah. Okay, okay, awesome.
Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here on time. Um, we are just waiting for a couple folks to arrive. So it might be, I think we're going to give it another five minutes or so before we start. So just to let everybody know, be sh beginning shortly.
Hi, everybody. Thank you all for being here, and thank you for your patience. Um, word is that traffic is uh, characteristically bad out there at the moment, so uh, we wanted to give people a couple minutes to get here, but we are going to kick things off. Um, I wanted to thank you all so much for joining us here tonight for this very special event. My name is Joe Potts. I'm an assistant professor here in the art department at Cal State LA. And I'm also the founder and co-director of the Southland Institute, an organization dedicated to implementing meaningful, accessible, sustainable alternatives in design and art education. This event is the first collaboration between Southland Institute and Cal State LA. I'd like to say a huge thank you to some of the people without whom this event wouldn't have been possible, um, to Jimmy Moss and the art department at Cal State LA, and to Southland Institute for supporting and funding this event, to Iris Chu and Owen Miller for helping to facilitate captioning and documentation, Ron Rees and the folks at the USU Theater for allowing us to hold the event in this space, and Heidi Partita in the art department office for helping make sure all the paperwork was always in order. Um, and then of course, thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. Uh, earlier this year, Inventory Press published the book, um, Cyber Feminism Index, which is edited by Mindy Sue and which is a printed document of an ongoing project and website of the same name, which is an interactive and ever-growing collection of entries that fall under the expansive umbrella of cyberfeminism. Tonight, Mindy is going to give us all an introductory tour to the physical version of the index, the book, and to talk more about the larger project that it's a part of, which will be followed by a discussion that she'll facilitate with our panelists tonight, um, who include Cyberfeminism Index contributors A.M. Dark, Dorothy Santos, Cecia Dominguez-Lopez, and Cal State LA design faculty Annika Serene. I'm going to introduce Mindy and then hand things over to her, 
and she'll also introduce tonight's panelists in more detail. Um, and I have a small number of books available for sale uh, outside after the event if anybody wants some. Um, and yeah, so come and see me afterwards if you'd like to pick up a book. Mindy Sue is a designer and technologist based in New York City. Her expanded practice involves archival projects, technocritical writing, performative lectures, design commissions, and close collaborations. Her latest writing surveys historical precursors of the metaverse and reveals the materiality of the internet. Mindy's ongoing cyber feminism index, which gathers three decades of online activism and net art, was commissioned by Rhizome and presented at the New Museum and is a recipient of a Graham, Found Graham Foundation grant. She has lectured internationally at cultural institutions, academic institutions, and mainstream platforms, and has been a resident at McDowell, Sitterberg Foundation, Pioneer Works, and Internet Archive. Mindy holds an MDes from Harvard's Graduate School of Design and a BA in Design Media Arts from the University of California, Los Angeles. She's currently assistant professor at Rutgers Mason Gross School of Arts and a critic at Yale School of Art. So everyone could please help me give a very warm welcome to Mindy Sue. Thanks so much, Joe. Um, and thanks again to all of you for coming out tonight. I also want to give a special thank you to the Southland Institute as well as Cal State LA and the Department of Art. It's my first time on this campus. It's quite beautiful, so I'm very happy to be here. So tonight, we'll talk about the Cyber Feminism Index. So this book was created through conversation. Um, it's a source book. It's a chronology that's annotated. And it's also a collection of online activism and net art from the past three decades. Structured as an index of indexes. And I'll kind of walk you through what that means. Let me just move this mic over here. But before talking about the book structure, what is cyber feminism? So there are many different definitions of cyber feminism. Historically, it was kind of left quite open. Maybe I'll move this back. Bit of reverb. Um, and this allowed for the constant mutation and redefinition of the term. So as people came across it, they were then able to self-identify and allow it to constantly change over time. So if you were to ask me how I define this term, I would start by unpacking the word itself. So this prefix cyber first emerged in Norbert Wiener's cybernetics of the 1940s. Are people familiar with this field of study? Few hands. Um, so in the most simplistic one-liner, cybernetics proposes that not only do you impact a system, that system is also impacting you. So you're in this constant feedback loop of behavioral change of inputs and outputs. Cyber then appeared in cyberspace in uh, William Gibson's Neuromancer of the 1980s. Has anyone read this science fiction novel? So Neuromancer was important for a lot of reasons because it kind of predicted these sensory networked online landscapes that we're very much talking about today. Think the metaverse or virtual realities. But Gibson's cyberspace was also very much characterized by the male gaze. So you have fembots and cyber babes and depictions of women and assistant or robotic like roles. So when cyber was then fixed to feminism by the British cultural theorist Sadie Plants and the Australian art collective VNS Matrix, it was almost an oxymoron or a provocation. How could feminists and women and marginalized communities kind of shape what cyberspace might be? And there were all sorts of examples that are techno-utopic to dystopic that you can find in this book. The sticker, though, comes from the website of the Old Boys Network. So the sticker itself comes from the web page of Helene von Oldenburg in which she asked the public about what they thought cyber feminism might be. As you might guess, it was met with a lot of confusion at that time and perhaps still is today and possibly by design. So the Old Boys Network, instead of creating a concise definition, they instead gave 100 antitheses for what it was not. This manifesto, the 100 antitheses, gave 100 definitions 
definitions as to what cyber feminism did not include and was not, rather than talking about what it was in a very poetic and playful way, in the attempts to be more inclusive and adaptable. So this book is also the edited hard copy of a soft copy. called cyberfeminismindex.com. So this website was made in collaboration with Angeli Meitzler, Janine Rosen, and Charles Praskowski. And this really serves as the living index or complement to this book. Typically, when we see websites, we see them as mutable, ephemeral, and perhaps not as legitimate or reputable as something like a printed book. But what we're trying to do is actually do the inverse. The book serves as a snapshot or a document of the website's mutation, while the book will continue to grow and crowdsource entries in perpetuity. So it's hard to see in this video, but there is a submit button at the bottom left. So I highly encourage you to submit your own work, submit those of your peers or historical references, and really contribute to this co-authored volume. This book is also an interface filled with hyperlinks. And typically when we hear the word interface and hyperlinks, it has a somewhat digital connotation. Um, but their, their precursors are actually quite analog. So things like bibliographies, footnotes, citations, indexes, these are seen as uh, analog hyperlinks. So in this book, in each of the entries, there are these green pills that act as hyperlinks that push and pull you throughout the book in a nonlinear way. So in fact, in entry 146, Cyberfeminism, Connectivity, Critique, and Creativity from 1999, in their editor's notes, they actually call their uh, cross-references hypertextual links. And then throughout the book's pages and the margins, you have these eye icons that push and pull you to different parts of the book for entries that are complementary or juxtaposed. So if you were to follow a hyperlink learning trail in this book, that might read something like this. Cyberfeminism is a mutating word with a nebulous history. Its evolution is less a single root system with multiple branches than a network of entangled rhizomes, constantly and multidirectionally moving. Virginia Barrett of the Australian art collective VNS Matrix has described cyberfeminism as anti-genealogical, anti-authorial, and a hostile mucus, never faithful to any origins. Cross-reference eight. Eight, VNS Matrix, 1991. The most consistent VNS Matrix genesis story is that VNS Matrix crawled out of the cyber swamp in the particularly hot summer of 1991 and via an aesthetics of slime initially generated as porn by women for women. VNS Matrix forged an unholy alliance with technology and its machines and spewed forth a blasphemous text which was the birth of cyber feminism. VNS Matrix was on a mission to hijack the toys from techno cowboys and remap cyberculture with a feminist bent. This is one story. There are also stories about a slime consciousness operating via spiral space. Cross-reference 181. One eighty one. Tales from the Puppet Mistress, Gash Girl, two thousand. Years after losing my machine virginity to a Mac 512K, I have slipped through the reality grid into the clear violent haze of spiral space. Desire, I slide through the luminous screen to inhabit the spaces between words. The keyboard is constantly sticky. Madness, an erotically reconstructed irreplicant, my bio code is being rewritten. This is better than any drug. Cross-reference 646. 646, Disquartisadora, 
Ripper. Mestiza of the Southern Pussy, meat of a pussy that expels word vomit, conserved by death and disgust of the colonization representing an ancestral systemic violation in live meat. I do not feel pride because I was born full of prejudices. No man's land, cross-reference 95. Ninety-five, Confessions of a Webback, Guillermo Gomez Pena, 1997. You call yourself a webback. Do you see yourself as an intruder on the net? Yes, the number of Latino students, artists, and activists on the net is minute. But we want to participate in the national and cultural debates, and many are permeated by technology. I consider myself a coyote, a smuggler of ideas. We want net inhabitants to get used to a new cultural sensibility, but we do encounter the linguistic border patrol. So the section that we're in now feels kind of like an encyclopedia. And similar to an encyclopedia, you probably wouldn't read that cover to cover. You might open the book at random, find an entry that resonates with you, and then in this book, you can jump to complementary themes throughout using these cross-references or hyperlinks. If you want a guided tour, there's also a section of collections. So this is where we asked various artists, activists, scholars, and collectives to create various themes and select 10 to 20 entries from the book on that theme. So for example, Skawanadi, who's largely considered the first indigenous net artist, created the collection about indigenous futurism. You also have a collection of the cybernetics of sex by Melanie Hoff. If you're looking for something more intentionally, there's also an index of titles, as well as an index of people. But if you're looking for something uh, more serendipitously, there's also an index of images. All New Gen, VNS Matrix, 1992. Sabotage the databanks of Big Daddy Mainframe. Your guides through the contested zone are renegade DNA sluts. The most wicked is Circuit Boy, a dangerous techno bimbo. Be prepared to question your gendered construction. Genital Panic, Mary Magic, 2020. We must reconsider the normative body and how disobedient bodies are already pathologized. From the medicalization of infants born of ambiguous genitalia to the disqualification of intersex athletes on the basis of biology, these guidelines matter. They determine how we are policed and how we are surveilled. The Black Trans Archive, Danielle Brathwaite Shirley, 2020. Welcome to the pro-Black, pro-trans archive. This interactive archive was made to store and center Black trans people, to preserve our experiences, our thoughts, our feelings, our lives, to remember us even when we are at risk of being erased. So in order to enter this archive, you're first greeted with three options. The first is if you're black and trans, the second is if you're trans, and the third is if you're cis. And depending on your selection, you would have access to a different body of content within this online space. Time Traveler, Skawanadi, 2008. This is a website from the future. Watch for upcoming episodes in which Hunter Deerhouse sails to Europe with Pocahontas in AD 1615, aids and abets the Dakota Sioux Uprising of 1862, and finds true love in the Kahnawake Mohawk Territory in 2009. So what you're seeing here is a trailer um, of the machinima. A machinima is a portmanteau of machine and cinema. These were typically plays that happened within video games 
and they recorded and ended up becoming video art pieces. So you can actually watch all six episodes of Scalinati's Time Traveler on their site. Afro Cyber Resistance, Tabata Rezaire, 2014. We need to quickly snap out of the web 2.0 fantasy of the internet as a promised land. Whatever visions that ideologically shaped this technology at the beginning of the development of computers have now successfully been structurally organized to serve the primary interests of North American governmental bodies and the commercial interests of the world's wealthiest companies. The Bitch Mutant Manifesto, VNS Matrix, 1996. Your fingers probe my neural network. The tingling sensation in the tips of your fingers are my synapses responding to your touch. It's not chemistry, it's electric. Don't ever stop fingering my separating holes extending my oozing boundary. But in spiral space, there is no they, there is only us. Suck my code. I will read just a couple more of these. This can be a little sensitive to light, so let's see if it scans. Okay, and we're gonna skip daddy residency. Oh, there it is. I saw it for a second. The thing with using new tech is it's quite fickle. But as cyber feminists will say, they really embrace the glitch. Let's see. OK. All right, the Old Boys Network, 1997. The Old Boys Network is regarded as the first international cyber feminist alliance. Normally, the term old boys network is used as a metaphor to describe an informal interrelation of men. Nowadays, the old boys network may be used for a dangerous cyber feminist virus. So as you can see, the voices throughout this book are quite cacophonous. Um, some of them have clear through lines, some of them really complement each other, and some of them really criticize each other. And I think that's kind of the goal of a very co-authored history. I typically like to end these readings with the acknowledgments. So this is a title sequence. Um, typically these are reserved for the ends of films. But it goes to show the vast network of people that really made something like this possible. So not only the people who produ uh, helped produce the book, like the designers, the publishers, lithographers, editors, but also all the people who helped maintain the voices within, the forward and afterward in the collections. But more so, 70% of this index is crowdsourced. So it first started with phone calls where I talked to all of these people and they referred me to others, and it kind of spiderwebbed from there. And then when we released the website in 2020, these are all the people that submitted through the online index, cyberfeminismindex.com. So people have asked, if this uh, collection or index is crowdsourced, then why is your name on the cover? And this is something that my collaborator, Laura Combs, and I discussed a lot when we were designing the book. So often when you see these catalogs or huge compendiums or history books, the byline is very small or even invisible. Because this book has so much heft and it compiles so many things, we actually wanted to make the authoring editor quite pronounced, not to have someone to celebrate, but rather to have someone to blame because there's a lot of subjectivity within these books as they are throughout all history books and all compendiums. 
So as you kind of move through this book, I highly encourage you to see um, whether you think other things might live nicely alongside some of these entries in the online site, and we are gathering there in perpetuity. Another thing great about this project has been these social gatherings. These really feels like calls to action as a way to create material gatherings, to collect more for this index. It's also gave me an opportunity to speak with a lot more people who have very complementary research themes. And tonight we have a, a great panel that we're gonna go deeper into some of these topics with. And I'm gonna introduce them now. So first we have Dorothy Santos. Dorothy is a Filipino American storyteller, poet, artist, and scholar whose academic research and creative interests include feminist media histories, critical media anthropology, computational media, technology, race, and ethics. She is a PhD candidate in film and digital media at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She received her master's degree in visual and critical studies at the, at the California's College of the Arts and holds a bachelor's degree in philosophy and psychology from the University of San Francisco. Her work has been exhibited at Ars Electronica, Rewire Festival, Fort Mason Center for Arts and Culture, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, and the GLBT Historical Society. Her writing appears in Art 21, Art in America, Ars Technica, among many others. And in 2022, she received the Mozilla Creative Media Award for her interactive docu-poetics work, The Cyborg's Prosody. A.M. Dark is an ex artist experimenting with media in the form of games, software, performance, social practice, and more. She's a professor of performance, play, and design, digital arts, and new media, and critical race and ethnic studies, as well as the founding director of the Center for Black Virtuality at UC Santa Cruz. He's developing the open source Afro Hair Library, which is in this book, an intervention in computer graphics, providing free assets in celebration of black hair texture, textures and styles. AM is a neurodivergent, gender chaotic black woman who values agency, comfort, and direct communication. His works integrates his identities and interests ranging from being queer, blackity black American, first gen college student, first out of generational poverty, and a lifelong fascination with hair, beauty, fashion, pop culture, and social mores. Annika Serene is an assistant professor here of design at Cal State LA and a graphic designer practicing in Los Angeles. Her research interests spread across design systems used in folk cultures, culture-specific aesthetics, and process-oriented design. She investigates ways of making practice in creative folk communities to construct innovative tools and methods useful in design. Her work contributes to an inclusive design heritage that shapes the politics of decolonization in design and creates a dialogue with social constructs of identity and power in design. And last but not least, we have Cecia Dominguez Lopez. Cecia is a systems and care designer, educator, and cultural worker striving for our collective liberation. Rooted in abolitionist and healing justice movements, they explore ancestral legacies of healing to nourish ecologies of care centering the health and dignity of Black and Indigenous communities. Rooted in the body and a pleasure-based approach, they primarily work with organizers, movement-based organizations, and other frontline communities impacted by prison and border violence. They currently experiment with caring designs through their work at Color Coded and the Care Economies Project. So with that, I'd like to welcome the panelists up to the stage and we'll start our panel. Just moving some tech for the live transcription. Test, test. Okay. 
So I'm going to start by asking each of our panelists a specific question just to kind of introduce their practices to you more, and then we'll segue into a group discussion. So first, Dorothy. Hello. So Dorothy, your collaborator, Salome Sega and I, um, you were some of the first people I spoke with when starting this project four years ago. Um, so your collective refresh, res or one of their first projects was curating the Refiguring the Future exhibition in 2019. And this was drawn from Morishin Aliari's term. So can you describe refiguring and how this differs or intensifies forms of intersectional feminism? It's a hard question, sorry, but. So, e so easy. Yeah, starting off. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, you know, usually, so first of all, thank you. I'm so honored to be on this panel and uh, with you. And thank you so much for the invitation. Normally I'm okay with not receiving questions beforehand, but when I saw your question, I was like, oh, this, I'm glad I have a few days to think about this. Um, but re refiguring, um, I'm gonna try to keep this short. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, I keep thinking about, my, my, my brain kind of went back to how, you know, years ago um, in San Francisco, I had this, a palm reading done and with Bean, Bean Gilsdorf, who's a, an artist. And one of the things that she said was, you know, every seven years, our cells change over. So we're completely different people. And I couldn't stop thinking about that in preparation for the panel and answering your question about ref refiguring, because I think of other permutations of refiguring, which I think the Cyber Feminism Index actually allows. People think that there's a permanency to the book itself, but it's just a start. It, and I felt that the exhibition and the conference that, you know, Refresh uh, organized in 2019, well, it was way before 2019, I mean, that's when everything happened, but kind of even rethinking Morrison's version of it in relation to digital colonialism and what does it mean for things to change over time? What does it mean when you destroy, when something is destroyed? How then do you reconfigure it? Or what happens when something is in a transitory state? And even now, looking back, <laughs> looking back from 2019 to now, I, I've changed. I mean, I think um, the last thing I'll say about reconfiguring or refiguring, sorry, see the, the slippage, the, like as my partner would say, the Levenstein distance, there's like so little, um, there's so much more in common than we think. But refiguring to me now means accepting that things will change and to be flexible and to be agile, especially within the arts. And I think cyber feminism, as you can see through the index that you've shown, it, it's, it's not only just growing from 2019 to now to the future, it's a place for people to, it's its own choose your own adventure. To me, that's what refiguring um, has meant to me, I guess, recently. That kind of is a little bit more into my practice because I really love games. But, um, and I know AIM can speak to that, no, not to, no pressure. But um, yeah, that's how I would answer that in the, the simplest way. You know, uh, I love this because it reminds me of Camila Janan Rashid. In her bio, she describes herself as a learner, not as an educator. And I think that through this routine learning process, we're actually really encouraging people to go out of their way to embrace the ability that we can transition, learn, and revise our ideas over time in all disciplines, but especially within cyber feminism, embracing this constant mutation. So thank you so much, Dorothy. AM, um, as an artist and game maker, you create radical tools for social intervention. How does the interactivity of games suggest the potential for these new future imaginaries? Um, unlike Dorothy, I actually read the questions maybe 10 minutes before I left the hotel. Um, I also think it's way too quiet out there because it's making me really nervous. I just like feel like I want to shake my body. We need to like loosen up. Mindy's voice is quite soft and polished, but everything she said was hilarious. So I just felt like it was really great deadpan thank comedy. You. I had some jokes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> the presentation, I was like, oh, I see this. Um, so with my chaotic energy, I am going to say that I don't really look at games in that way because I think games, um, 
games I start to see as more of a product or, I mean, that, you know, games take uh, play, something that is chaotic and something that, you know, you can't sort of really commodify and turn it in, and give it structure, right? And so I actually think that play is where the space of um, potentiality is for imagining futures. And when I think about play, I think it's so low stakes in terms of its engagement, but the possibilities are so high. So to borrow a term from a totally different space, um, you know, uh, low expectations, high possibilities. And like, that's what play is. Whereas games for me, especially because I do make games and I like, I'm very much an antagonist to like the idea of a game industry. I, yeah, I want something that feels like there isn't, there isn't a marked goal. And instead what we're doing is we are co-creating, we are failing spectacularly, we're doing that um, together. Because I think that's something that I really learned is that in order to imagine these possibilities, it's really about the collective, right? So this is why I love you know, a collection like this. This is why I love seeing um, it manifest in different forms. And when I think about the open source Afro Hair Library, I learned a lot of those lessons too. Like, it can't just be me creating something and I can't even be too beholden to, you know, the set idea, which is very easy to do in, within all of the institutions that I'm a part of, whether that's, you know, like, you know, trying to make a game that, that and you have to think about uh, target demographics, right? Or whether you're, I just got tenure last year, so I don't have to pretend to know things anymore. <laughs> um, but, you know, so it's like, you have to make yourself legible in a certain way. So it's easy to get really fixed, whereas play, knocks all of that off the table and says like, our only goal maybe is to be together and to explore and to tinker. And then we get to um, reflexively say, oh, what came of that? Let's go in that direction. Yeah. Yeah, I like this idea of not having like these predetermined notions of output or even these like this idea of reward. There, Hicha Styro has an essay about gaming where she says, video games are typically allocated to a certain silo but we have to remember our entire society is gamified. This is how we move through the world because we're in a very commodifiable, uh, incentive-oriented culture. Mm -hmm. So changing that entire context focused on play and lack of expectation seems like a worthy but very difficult goal. So maybe we'll unpack that more Yeah, it, today. Annika. So your work ranges from design to projection mapping to surfacing underrepresented communities. What does urban intimacy mean to you and how might this apply to a digital terrain? I'm a planner, so I took notes. I love how everyone's saying how prepared or lack of prepared they are. Um, but I want to start by talking a little bit about what intimacy means to me in an urban setting. And built form often draws a line between what's private and public, uh, you know, a division that kind of separates the interior from the exterior, the domestic from the civic, the micro from the macro, and the personal from the political, slicing the body of collective life through binary opposition. So we begin to understand intimacy as something that's more private, proximate, and embodied in fact, even in public spaces that do enable some form of intimacy, it is regulated through laws or zoning or policing structures. The kind of connections that can be formed in public spaces can be highly regulated. And uh, you know, in terms of how I feel about intimacy, it fills space with meaning, enables us to form intimate associations, transforming space into place. It becomes essential to embrace intimate in its many forms in public spaces and rethink intimacy as inclusive and plural. Intimacy can be considered as a framework through which space is produced and societal norms are formed or transformed. And uh, it's really interesting when you asked me to think about how this kind of transforms into cyberspace. Um, and it was running in my mind last night and it's kind of, you know, going in circles, kind of figuring that out. Um, you know, because cyberspace can be really chaotic and organized all at once, where each browser window can be a potential space for new social, political, cultural, or personal associations that transform at a rapid pace, too. 
Um, as we have the freedom to create new associations with every passing minute, intimacies can be both familiar and estranged, a uh, hybrid space that offers intimacy as plural. And you know, beyond these uh, associations, online interactions also foster this constant reproduction of the self without the body that enables for an expansive human experience. Um, so cyberspace exists in complete contrast to the urban public space as one regulates and the other liberates. Oh, I'm curious to unpack this. Um, because many people might say there's so much overlap, but I think you're mm -hmm. right. Because of this spatialization, mm -hmm. um, maybe removed from a lot of other senses, we actually do have to interrogate these spaces much more distinctly. Yeah. And Cecia, in your work with Color Coded, your collective, you provided an expansive definition of technology, referring to ancestral technologies. Do you want to kind of unpack this for us? Sure, yeah, happy to. Hello, everyone. Um, buenas tardes, good evening. Um, yeah, I think for Color Coded, we just started with the, you know, dictionary definition of tech, which is really um, thinking about your knowledge in a particular area, right? So at the end of the day, we're talking about wisdom, what knowledge, what wisdom. Um, are you good at, or do you find pleasurable? Like, you know, what brings you um, life force and joy um, in terms of centering those technologies is um, what we explored at Color Coded. And our ancestral technologies exploration kind of came from understanding that we live in a world design um, that centers whiteness, right? That centers a certain kind of knowledge creation and a certain kind of wisdom and positions them at the center, right? Positions them as um, better than others. Um, and we're very talking about, very much talking about, you know, whiteness as a world design coming from the imagination of like cis, wealthy, landowning, mostly straight, Christian, Eastern European white men, right? And they did a really good job of exporting that, um, their technologies and their world design um, across the globe. And so for us, Color Coded became a space to kind of be like, well, um, you know, one of the first talks that we did was called Business as Usual Cancelled. And all of us were coming either, you know, from nonprofit spaces, academia, um, the tech world, the art world, and just being fed up with um, the dominant world design. And Color Coded, which is a you know, PLC only um, space here in LA became kind of our space to explore that, to be able to be like, what are ancestral wisdoms? What are the knowledges that we carry um, that haven't been honored and not only have not been honored, but some of them have been lost and some of them haven't like even gotten a chance to emerge and for us to play with them, right? So having a safe space for us to really be able to explore, create, and go into imaginations um, was really like the, the origin story of, of our group. We called it like our POC support group. Yeah. I think that's also so nice because when we think of technologies, we always have a very high tech connotation of them. And we forget that these things come from historical lineages, which I think your collective really traced really well. So from like the cross reference to the hyperlink or even fermentation barrels to now high tech preservation processes. I think understanding where these things come from always allows us to give some attribution, but also helps kind of prevent the cyclical effect and allow for some mutation over time. Yeah, what I was just going to add is that, yeah, for us, um, ancestral tech also means re-indigenizing tech, right? And so if you um, honor technology and honor other beings outside of um, the digital, a lot can become possible. So um, right now, some of our explorations are through our elemental tech pod, where we're looking at the elements as technologies, um, knowing like they have a lot of wisdom to teach us, and how does that um, support our bodies, our you know emotional, spiritual, energetic bodies, but also our collective bodies and the bodies of land, water, flora, mineral, right around us. So. If our infrastructure had a respectful relationship with these elements, with these technologies, like what could our world design look like? Yeah, exactly, a less extractive model. I think 
when we think about the history of technological development, we also forget that indigenous people and immigrant populations had a huge role in how it developed in the US. So for example, a lot of Chinese laborers were actually the ones building the tunnels for these fiber optic cables, or even the Texas instrument. I don't know if this generation used that, but there were these old big calculators they required on their circuit boards really complex weaving, so they actually hired Navajo women to create those kinds of uh, wire structures. So I think we have to remember that even if we don't hear about them, doesn't mean they weren't part of this very formative, these very formative tools. Yeah, um, I just wanted to add to that because I was so, um, again, it's uh, I've already like teared up like three times. I'm definitely probably gonna cry on stage, but like just being in a space like this where you know there's so much. Um, overlap, right? Um, one of the notes I was taking was thinking about um, exactly the things that you're saying and thinking about like with Open Source Software Hair Library, something that I've been thinking about was really like how to redefine who and what is considered a technologist, right? And so like thinking about, um, you know, so we have these models of, of um, these 3D models of black hair textures and styles, and then that's kind of the shiny part because it's like, oh, games, oh, animation, oh, you know, computer graphics. But I actually like spend time talking to hair stylists and saying, hey, you know, you are a technologist, like the things that you have to do, even thinking about the weaving, like the manipulation of coming up with styles or coming up with technologies. Like, I am not a capitalist, however, it's interesting to me in the US context that the first woman millionaire in this country was a black woman because she was creating black hair care products mm -hmm. to fit into a white supremacist, you know, beauty standard, which was compulsory. But that to me is like exactly the sort of thing that um, gets obscured and it does not fall into the model of who we, we imagine to be. Like if you, I'm sure if you Google technologists, you're not gonna see a bunch of people who look like us yeah. doing the kinds of work that we're talking about. <laughs> so to kind of add to this idea of lineage, um, but maybe more recent, starting in the 90s, starting with the rise of the World Wide Web in 1989, early cyber feminism was really painted with provocations, especially in their language. You hear things like slime theory, you have cunts and gashes and glitches, bodies and cyborgs and interruptions. We kind of lose some of this language on the internet now. And I'm curious, do we still have these types of provocations on the internet? And what do bodies look like online today? You really know how to ask uh, difficult questions. <laughs> Just focus on one part of it. <laughs> I'm also asking these because I have the same questions for myself, right? Yeah. Well, um, is there, okay, let me, yeah. let me jump in there. Um, <laughs> I, I also am very partial to the voice because my, my academic research is actually on voice and voice recognition, speech technologies, um, you know, voice cloning, et cetera, et cetera. So I actually study how human voices are trained. And that includes like 911 dispatchers, telephone operators. There's a very specific um, affect, you know, involved. And so when I hear your question, there's a part of me, my brain goes directly to, but what about that which is not seen on the internet because it also gives way to how we imagine, you know, typically how someone might look. Um, I've been, okay, real talk, I speak differently across different communities. Oh, the code switching is real. It's real. And, you know, because this is not how I, I you know, if, if my mom was sitting here, she'd be like, you don't talk like that uh, at home, you know, or even friends from when I was growing up in San Francisco's Mission District, et cetera. But I say this because when you ask uh, what these types of bodies, um, albeit unwieldy on the internet, look like or feel like, or to me, it's what they sound like. And um, I mean, that gives a little bit more about my own kind of investment in what I see, but more so what I hear, because, you know, that is a real thing, you know, and I, I think a lot of this stuff came out of the 80s and 90s, especially, you know, one of my favorite film scholars, uh, Shelley Stamp, wrote this um, article like in the in the 90s and it was about uh, 70s horror and she said why is everyone so obsessed with the the young woman the teenage the child and the young woman's body because in horror so what you're asking my brain went straight there because horror you actually see it even contemporaneously you see it in like Lovecraft Country 
that that the bot the, that the horrors that we face with whether it's xenophobia, racism, transphobia, it actually comes out of the mutation of the body. So the internet actually allows for some type of mutation to occur where people feel that they won't get hurt, but there is implications to that, like real, real consequences to what you do on the internet, which we see now, you know? And I, I, um, I actually have been off social, I mean, I'm trying to finish this paper that I'm calling, it's a dissertation, but I call it a paper, but like, I've actually gone off the, gotten off social media completely for the past few years because I found it unwieldy for the very question that you ask. So I can only imagine, and sorry if I'm pontificating, I can only imagine what my nieces, my nephews, my students go through. I didn't have to, any of this image and sonic um, inundation. You know, and the last thing I'll say, um, because I don't want to hear from everyone here, um, is, you know, I was reading something this morning from, a, you know, my good friend that's here with me, Anna, you know, um, one of her good friends is coming out with a book called Poetry is Spellcasting. And this thing that Audre Lorde talked about when she was working on her own, when, on Zami, which is like this kind of bio -mytho mythology about her life, where she, she looks at the arithmetics of distance. So how much do we think about, like, one ripple or one gesture of what we say online or how we act can actually have a ripple effect to someone we don't even know. And so imagine someone grappling with that, you know, at least 30, 40, you know, years ago. But that's kind of my visceral reaction to your question. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking back to, um, I was thinking in a totally different direction, but I'll jump off on one thing that you said when you're talking about the voice. So. Um, I started a, uh, teaching a class or, uh, called Black Aesthetics, Interventions in Digital Media. And one of the exercises that we do, um, that I do with my students is I have them make like a mood board. I'm like, so what does Siri look like? What does Alexa look like? And they have to put it together. And I'm like, yeah, like where, where, like, where do they live? What's their gender? Like, what kind of house do they live in? Do they live in a house? Like, do they live in some weird box or series of like cables? Like, and um, y'all, uh, Siri and Alexa are like white women who eat salads and uh, have nothing in their homes. Like it is like there was a golden retriever at one point, like that was as much pets as we got. It was really interesting to see how that voice, you know, was chosen and, and how it relates to like, um, at least how the, this generation was imagining that person and all of those connotations thereof. Um, that's one point, I have three, that I'm just gonna rapid fire them. The second one was I was thinking about in terms of body. Um, one of the things I really love about uh, Danielle Brockwaite Shirley's work, um, especially in the Black Trans Archive, but really across all of her work, is the way that she um, uses cyber bodies because I feel like they really don't fit into the typical aesthetic where it's like, oh, it's like, you know, it's polished and it's matching, you know, it, it's not aspiring to achieve a kind of corporeal ontology. And so um, I, I really love that because I think that is where I see the slime. That is where I see something that just feels like more expansive and raw and somehow actually feels more corporeal because it feels dirty and itchy and like like sweaty in a way that like we're not used to seeing in these um, tech spaces. Um, and then going back to um, corporeal ontology, like uh, which is to I, whenever I use academic words, I know we're in a university, I'm like, let's say that in a way that my, people from my neighborhood would understand, which is like matching the physical reality, like going for the truth of like what this space is like. Um, and so an example of that, um, I'm always looking for ways in which this fails, especially in spaces um, that are productivity based, right? It's easy to look at this in games and like different more, you know, fantastical experiences. But when the pandemic happened and so much of our like so many people who thought the internet's not a real place. It's like, yeah, the internet's a real place and it's in your house and your, your, your boss is there and it sucks. <laughs> um, but uh, a feature, so like if we are all on Zoom right now and we turned on that blur background because it's like my partner's over there or my cat or my place is messy and I did not position the camera just to see that one really cool picture and the series of books I haven't read but that I want you to know that I intend to read or whatever. Um, <laughs> If I blur my background, it tries to polish my hair. So curly and kinky hair does not work. It tries to take off any rough or errant edges. And so again, I think in terms of like the aesthetics that we have because of who they are dictated by, I often refer to Mark Zuckerberg as like the human embodiment of milk. Like he is going for neutral, like he's going for true neutral and like offend no one, just exist. 
And like, that's not even shade. That's just honestly what I think he's doing. And you see how that um, goes into like that idea of neutrality or polish. And so polish in this case or neutrality means, well, that curl's sticking up and we don't want that. Let's just, let's, we'll, we'll fix you. We'll fix you by getting rid of anything that we think is textural or slimy or too human because like, let's just turn you into a 3D character and like that wouldn't be sticking up. So I don't have answers, but I sure have a lot of questions. <laughs> Yeah, um, same here. And following the trend of disclosing how prepared we were, um, I did peek at the questions enough to kind of um, think about like, oh, how am I going to talk about um, cyber feminism when so much of my work um, is outside of the digital? So even though I might be a technologist, um, so much of the technology that I do, right, and going back to um, wisdoms and the things that we're talking about, right? Like one of my favorite um, technology, you know, places of play is with plants and really thinking about the knowledge and the wisdom that plants bring into my body. Um, and when we're thinking about technologies, um, I also, digital technologies, was com what comes to mind is like my digital body, right? And speaking to um, the tech is not neutral, the neutrality of it, like that was one of the for that's literally like why color coded existed. It was like tech is not neutral. Um, even though all of these technologies are designed with certain bodies in mind, and although we all have um, digital bodies, considering where we are in our world design and how technology is so infused, um, who is seen as a digital user or whose digital body is respected? Um, it's so different, and at the end of the day, we're also just talking about like material needs, right? Like it's it's hard to play in the digital sphere when you're fucking surviving, and you're excuse the explicitives, but like when you're um, you know you're coming out of the pandemic, like um, there's a lot of folks that while technology offered you know that closeness, that connection. Um, it also didn't do much for a lot of folks because their digital body was very different, right? And so I think one thing that I really appreciate and love about Color Coded in our space is that it has allowed me to like be able to play in the digital sphere and to think about these things without being bitter as fuck, like healing <laughs> through it. Because I'm like, y'all are talking about the pluriverse and doing this and that and like, like we're just trying to like pay rent, like LA and the housing crisis here, like, you know what I mean? So um, yeah, so I wanna be not bitter and I wanna be playful and creative and, um, and play with technologies from, from that place, right? And so for me and for my communities that oftentimes is not within the digital sphere, right? We start someplace else um, and then through, you know, thinking about access, like there's things that um, then, then get fun, right? Because at the end of the day, um, I know that my, the, the users that I want to center, they, my community, they know what's best for them. So getting these digital tools that are, are able to bring some ease into our lives, um, a lot of us don't have access to them. So creating a safe space where we can have access to them, where we can put our hands on these um, toys on these digital toys um, becomes, yeah, what, what is fun and, and what our collective um, aims to do. And then, um, you know, I kind of have, um, I think about bodies, uh, you know, in the cyberspace, but then I also think about how that technology is integrated um, and there are like physical ro robots, right, that uh, look like us and talk like us. And I don't know if you've heard of Ada. Um, she's this ultra-realistic robot artist and she's doing performance art and drawing and painting and sculpture and her work is being exhibited all over the world in the museums. Um, but then I think about the representation of, of that idea of Ada is, is like, you know, a very binary representation in the form of the female body. And um, and so again, that, that makes me wonder that you can't have any kind of identity on the internet, right? I could be this mic and interact with, with, the, with the cyberspace as a mic. Uh, and that produces so many different types of interactions that are not possible in my daily life, in my real life. Uh, but then when we bring that technology and kind of implement its its representation uh, as a human form, 
uh, we I again go back to what what we're trying to you know not do or explore uh, in you know the cyberspace. Yeah, I think to just add to a few points that have been said here, um, I often reference the scholar Lisa Nakamura, and in the '90s she wrote this book essay anthology called Race in Dash Four Cybers Cyberspace Internet some synonym. Um, but essentially, she's talking about identity tourism. So when these spaces first existed, anyone could enter and be anything you wanted. So liberatory. And what they actually found is, instead of building empathy, which is what they hoped, it actually just exacerbated stereotypes. Because when you're racially passing, you're not bringing in the lived experiences of physical bodies into these digital landscapes. So instead, you're playing out certain tropes. And she calls this the form of racial passing or identity tourism. And to the earlier point about AIs um, or assistants, this group in LA called Feminist AI has done a study about why all of these assistants sound like women, Siri, Cortana, Alexa, et cetera. So I encourage you to all check that out. Okay, to pivot a little, let's talk about the collective. So community-oriented grassroots efforts have really pushed forward the development and teaching of new tools and also allowed for the subversion of existing tools. So let's talk about the evolution between DIY, do-it-yourself, to DIWO, or do it with others, and especially how that relates to your practices. Um, sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> I think the big thing is I've always thought that citations are a big feminist technology. And then we also hear this pronoun we instead of I often. So it's a question of do it yourself versus do it with others and why you think this shift is happening. Yes, thank you. Um, I would say that I think like going back to the earlier question of like ancestral technologies or um, and color-coded um, re-indigenizing technologies and re-indigenizing design. Um, for us, it's about, like, that has always been there. You know, do it, do it together <laughs> or do it ourselves um, is, is a legacy from a lot of our um, communities and a lot of our ancestors, right? Like, um, before colonization, that was um, our form of wisdom and our way of doing things. And so um, at Color Coded, um, a lot of the things that we do is like make space for that, right? Like how do we re-indigenize re our technologies? And um, while some of these digital technologies or, or digital terms are, are not made to be inclusive, right? Um, how do we remember our way forward? How do we um, think about um, bringing our whole selves into this space and um, and, and in that way, right, create, creating those glitches and um, creating um, different ways um, of using those said technologies that are not made for us. I also wanted the question repeated, so you know. <laughs> um, yeah, this is so interesting. Like, I think this one, like, um, this particular question I was reflecting on because I'm like, so much came up for me. I was like, well, do it yourself is fun, but doing it with others is great. And doing it yourself with others is like, sometimes that's the best option. And yes, I'm totally only talking about this right now. Um, <laughs> we started with like icky, sticky porno stuff. So I'm just, you know, thinking about that collectivity. Um, so I, I often use this um, analogy because, you know, I am a person who, it still feels new. I've had tenure for about a year. Um, but at 18, I didn't have a high school diploma. And, you know, I grew up in a space where I didn't have access to certain knowledge bases. I didn't have access to, to I didn't even know that there were people like me who were thinking these weirdo thoughts that I had. And I felt very isolated and then losing sort of access to formal education made me feel even more so like, oh, well now what do I do? And as I sort of traverse these different spaces, I felt very much on my own. And as much as I also am, I've gotten off of Twitter, I friggin' hate social media, it's useful, but like, 
I have that contentious relationship to it now and I'm, and I'm sort of leaving. I think it's like an, I've aged out of this trauma cycle, I think. But really social media and the internet and this space where you could meet people everywhere, you know, it, it really gave me the sense that like I was no longer an island but an archipelago. And I say that because when you are like a black, like I was the first black woman in the graduate program at UCLA in design media arts. And I am not that old y'all. Like I went to grad school in 2013. Like that was a big deal. And so when you're in this space and it's just you, and you don't have color coded collective yet, right? You think it's just you. And it's only through things like social media or like Issa Rae. I remember Issa Rae watching her YouTube series, Misadventures of an Awkward Black Girl, and being like, oh, oh, there are awkward black girls like me, right? Like, and so I, I see that. I hear what you're saying about this is how our communities have, have operated. Like, I'm thinking about FUBU, for us, by us. That's a thing, right? But I think for me, it was losing access to that as I gained access to more privileged spaces of so-called opportunity. And, and actually them having objective, like there were material opportunities, financial opportunities that I had and could explore, educational opportunities um, that I was able to take advantage of. And at the same time, a sort of silent thing for me that I never felt like I could say was like, I kind of miss being back at home. Even with all those challenges, I kind of miss being able to say like, these people who are so smart and so degree, do they know anything? These people are annoying as fuck and they're shitty sometimes and they seem to have just like waltzed on in here where I had to like climb and scrape. And I just miss like the sanity check of being able to say like, is this real? Is this okay? Is this fucked up? And so for me, I didn't have the opportunity to do things with others. I remember even when I was starting to make games, I would, I was a, I was a good artist, but I was a terrible student because I would go into these classes. I remember my first game, which won awards. It was great. When I was, I made it in a class and I was like, hey, I want to do this thing, unpacking like, you know, race and gender and, and, and standards of beauty in a game. If you were like, well, you got to use photos of black women if you want that to work. And I was like, yeah, but that would just recreate the trauma. Like, what if I just do these illustrations instead? And nobody got it. No one like saw my potential. I always had to make something first, then it had to get a bunch of awards, then it had to get external validation, and then people would go, oh, that was great. And then I'd make the next project, and the same problem would happen. You'd be like, well, I don't get it. And it'd be like, so I didn't have access to all these technologies. I had to do, th I, my first game was a card game because of that, you know? And so it was like, I got so used to having to do things on my own, wanting to collaborate, wanting to do it in a collective. And so for me, what I noticed is that with Open Source Afro Hair Library, I moved from this like space of making work that sometimes centered um, the more dominant cultural position, like me trying to make myself legible or my community legible, to being like, actually, I just want to center myself. I just want to center blackness. I want to center my community. And with OSAL, like, it's the scariest work I ever did because I was like, I don't know how to make a community. I'm so used to being by myself. So for me, it was an act of survival. It's like, I need this. I need to create. I need to create spaces and opportunities. Like I got here and I'm like, okay, let me, let me pull back the, the, you know, the hole in the gate and everybody come through because I need you here. Because if I don't have you here, I'm going to go crazy because all these people are still telling me they don't get it or it doesn't matter or why. And I know that you know why. 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 You know why. So yeah, it's not a choice. This is a prime example that proves why imposter syndrome is actually systemic, right? It's not, the blame is placed on the individual to question whether they belong, but it's because we're in a system where you're not actually invited or welcomed. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, I, I'll just, I, I, I want to talk about, I did not want to talk about work, but I will talk about work. <laughs> I, I, I work for a nonprofit uh, focused on open source software. And I think the challenge that I've seen over the years um, is that there are people that don't want to keep the open and open source open. And a lot of that has to do with um, conceptions of ownership, authorship, um, what it means to actually be a contributor, what, it, what does it mean, you know, like, uh, Cecia, Cecia, like Cecia was talking about, like, re-indigenizing, 
understanding a lot of these technologies and how they came to be, but being confronted with this very, you know, phenomenon of like, oh, how do I say this without with while being diplomatic? Some people, some people really want to hold on to what you know they feel they've created. And this comes from this kind of, it's rooted in this very kind of cyber libertarian 80s kind of like everything should be free, but I'm the one. I'm the one that wants to make it free. No, you, why? What's, you actually, the tenant and the ethos that you're talking about, you're not even doing. You are not actually engaging in that. And I think when you talked about the, you know, do it yourself, do it with others, it's, it, it, it's so easy to tear that down after years of building up the very ethos of doing it with others. And, and what does that mean? And I mean, Lauren Lee McCarthy is a really, you know, great example of, you know, it's not about flattening, it's about saying everyone is a contributor. It's a kind of also what AM is talking about, you know, in regard to bringing folks in that, you know, that they, that they have some entry point and that the entry point just becomes a beginning but not the place where you're kept. You know what I'm saying? It's like that, ooh, you know, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, what I would add to that, I think it's like for, um, you know, color, what, we have four hashtags that color coded that kind of um, are either like affirmations, mantra, like, uh, you know, we, we need to put some name to that, but um, tech is not neutral, everything is by design, um, embody abolition, build many worlds, right? So for me, this um, really speaks to our embody abolition um, saying and like what that means to us is like, none of us have lived outside of colonization, right? Like none of us have lived outside of whiteness. And if we understand that our bodies, our emotional bodies, ancestral bodies, like energetic bodies are shaped by our environment, um, that means that we're going to embody whiteness, we're going to embody white supremacy, we're going to embody patriarchy, we're going to embody all of these um, terrible ass practices that whiteness teaches us because whiteness is based on the logic of domination, punishment, and control. Um, and so for re-indigenizing re and practicing something different, right? Um, it's such practice and in um, at Color Coded, one of our collective commitments is to practice somatics um, because you're, again, our bodies, our nervous systems are shaped by our environments, right? And it takes like 300 repetitions to like learn a new habit. It takes like 3,000 repetitions um, to really embody it. And a lot of us are in positions in institutions and in environments where we're being taught otherwise. So unless we're practicing like collectivity, unless we're intentionally practicing care, practicing love, practicing being like patient and like compassionate with each other, we're just gonna hurt each other because that's the that's like the water, right, that we're swimming in. Um, so I think like yeah, finding um, finding places of practice, finding people that we feel safe to practice with. Um, you know, became very important to me. Um, again, because we're, unless we're um, doing this collectively and doing this together, or again, like I can't be healing by myself and you all are doing what you're all doing because then I'm gonna have to interact with you all. And so I need you all to do your work and I need myself to do my work, right? So how do we have more um, compassion with each other? And at the end of the day, we, that's something that can be taught, right? We can teach each other. Um, to practice care, to practice these kinds of things. So, um, you know, going back to the text and just the idea of like citation and um, and hypertext and all of these things, like that is a, a practice against whiteness, white colonial culture, white supremacist culture, right? Because we understand that I, not, nothing that I, if I'm in in relation to to the universe, nothing that I did is is mine. It's in a lineage of something. It's in a conversation of something. And we get to decide and name that for ourselves, right? Um, so I actually want to want to bring this back to something I wrote down at the very beginning, um, Mindy, when you were um, defining cyberfeminism and sharing it as an oxymoron. 
and how powerful that is. And this is connecting both with Cecilia saying and um, uh, kind of a little bit antagonist to what Dorothy said about the idea of, uh, when you said like some people want to like take the open out of open source, I was like, yeah, me. <laughs> and so uh, I wanna talk about that because um, open source Afro hair library is also oxymoronic in the sense that um, I was looking for, okay, what seems like the most white, vegan, farm to table, all my friends are vegan, I'm in the Bay Area, so trust, it's, it's not shade. But it was like, I still remember, like having traversed all these worlds, I still remember who I was and what I thought about certain words and how they were like, oh, that's not for me, I don't know anything about that. And um, open source, despite its lofty aspirations, is less diverse than tech overall. It is whiter, it is more male, and so you have to wonder why that is. So. When I thought about a word that would really encapsulate the sense of whiteness in tech, I thought open source. And so to take open source and then add Afro, like which is blackity black, I was like, okay, that's what I need to do to bridge these things. And so when I, as, I, as I've developed this, this project, I had to contend with this issue that um, an open source purist, cough, cough, a white dude somewhere, um, would say that there can be no limitations no limitations whatsoever on what you're putting out if you call it open source. But if you are a black person, if you are an indigenous person, you know what it means to make your resources, um, you know, to not protect them, to not protect them from those who would come and then privatize them. And so, and, you know, when you've been subject to material and cultural um, uh, exploitation, right? So I had to sit here and think about like, what does it mean to make something completely open source and have it be these virtual black bodies? How do, well, how do I, is it okay if cops take this and say, well, now we're gonna use this for our weird trainings? Or is it okay if someone wants to make racism simulator 3000 with this? And so I actually felt like, you know, I had to think, go back to that sense of like, what is the distinction between gatekeeping and caretaking? How do you protect something without imposing a proprietary logic, which is the logic of whiteness, that well, we must own and then we can decide who gets what. And so that's a very different logic than the logic, which is gatekeeping versus the logic of caretaking, which is like, we actually need to protect this to ensure that it survives for everyone. Um, yeah, so that brings us back to the, people might be mad at me when this project launches, I don't know. I just wanna, is Joe, how are we on time? Do we have time for one more? Yeah? Half an hour. Oh, okay. So I'm gonna ask both of these, but maybe we'll truncate them a bit just so we have time for a Q and A. Um, typically, we conceive of the internet as a very utopic 90s that has a gradient to a very dystopic now. And I'm curious if you agree with this or how we might complicate this. The dystopia, this, this dystopic thinking that feels quite ubiquitous right now, is that actually accurate in comparison to a very utopic 90s? Um, well, I was born in 91, so I'm actually like the same age as the internet. Um, and I just finished my Saturn return, um, which for folks that don't know what that means, it means that every three years you basically are supposed to like question all of your foundations and um, you have like a two year period to like renew your foundations, right? Um, so it's kind of fun to think about the internet going through its Saturn return um, because it's like, yeah, you all like need to do better. <laughs> you know, I think like, um, I mean, I was in a, I was very young in the 90s, and um, again, like just looking at the history of like where the internet came from, where Wi-Fi tech came from, like these were technologies that were developed by the military, right? Um, and some of the first um, internet or Wi-Fi connections, I, and and I, and I guess like you know the World Wide Web versus the other things, you know, come into play there. Um, but at the end of the day, like, if we think about who had access to design these technologies and to code it, to standardize it, to make it part of the quote, quote, canon, right, or all these things, like, it was all the same people. <laughs> it was all the same, you know, white men 
um, or, or under the logic of whiteness, just maybe like generations and generations and generations down the line, right? So um, I guess like, no, like the, the internet has never been utopic for me in, in the same way that like, um, like this dystopia that we live in, right? Or like these apocalypse, like the people talking about the pandemic as apocalypse, it's like, well, ap apocalypse for who and dystopia for who, right? Because for some of us, that apocalypse came like, um, you know, in 1492 with colonization and, um, and we're still trying to heal from that and repair from that. Um, and yeah, I think like, again, going back to, um, I, I love how you're talking about um, uh, open source and again, these, lo these logics, because again, all of these terms are still operating from the cosmology, from the world's view, from the world design of whiteness. And, you know, I also went to, uh, you know, predominantly white institution, like um, all of these things. And when I came back to com my community, I was like, you need to do this, you need to do that. And like, we need to talk about this and we need to talk about that. And it was all coming from like whiteness, centering whiteness. And I think like my healing journey in the last seven years, um, I like what Dorothy was talking about. It's like, I want to center blackness and be blackity black black, right? And I'm in my journey around what does it mean for me to center my ancestry, my Zapoteco lineage and be indigi, indigi, indigi queer, like in your face, right? About it. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, it, the Saturn return just ended, so we'll see how we'll see how the internet did. I'm like, y'all do better. Oh boy, I get to polish off my like taught a class little, little little vibes. Okay, so. Talking about who was doing what, I get to say a positive thing about games, back when games were actually radical. And then bring it back down because whiteness is the problem, sorry. Um, I, I was writing that the dystopia is never the technology, right? Because the technology is always an ongoing thing. Like we talked about who technologists are, all of that. It is whiteness and it has been whiteness for a long, long time. And whiteness is its own technology. It is the, the overall uh, oppressive technology that we're all subject to. Uh, don't get it twisted. Um, I want to talk about the Tech Model Rail Club out of MIT. So all of this technology, computers, you know, everything that we're doing, like the internet did come from the military, right? The reason why the Tech Model Rail Club was pretty fucking radical, even though, yes, it was a bunch of white dudes, because who has access to, you know, these affluent spaces, who has access to be in this institution and study, you know, computer science. What I loved about them is they were like, hey, there are these, like, entire rooms full of million-dollar equipment, these computers. And they're used for setting these like like launching tables or something. I don't know much about war, but like launching tables for like missiles and all that sort of thing. And that's what they were used for. That's what they were funded for. So they were like, what if we took that and turned it into a really expensive desk calculator? What if we took that and used it to do something totally silly and unproductive? That was the entire point. That's how games, uh, um, video games, digital games, that's, that's where they started. So I always thought that was incredibly radical and cool because they were like, screw this, like, let's do something really stupid, right, with this. But one of the earliest video games or digital games, this wasn't technically video, uh, was Space War. So that's where you have like a radical intention, right, an anti-militaristic intention, but still is following the logics of domination, which is why you can see all these years later, what do we have? We have Call of Duty where you get to simulate, you know, like, brutalizing brown people in foreign countries, right? And so again, I love what you're saying because it points to like, even when we have the best intentions, even when we think we're radical, even when we are trying to envision something different, if we don't interrogate um, a system of domination that really it, its logics are about like, man, y'all all need to go to the National History Museum of African, what you need to go to the National Museum of African American History and Culture in DC because it is such a great installation that shows you how when we think about whiteness, when we think about this group of people at a particular time, what they did is, is industrialize difference and caste and hierarchy and domination. And that was not the norm. It wasn't the norm then. It shouldn't be the norm now. But like that is the problem. We're never going to reach utopia if we don't unpack these systems of oppression that are intentional. That are it's, that's the first technology we need to deal with. Yeah, yeah, I agree with this. It's never about the tool; it's about how the tool is used. Um, 
one fun fact, because I love like computer facts based on what you're saying. Based off of, so Am mentioned like this military industrial complex in which the internet emerged. The computer mouse actually emerged from the light pen, which emerged from the light gun, which was used for military training. Anyways. Yeah. <laughs> Any additions? Um, I just want to add, uh, you know, again, this idea of dystopia and utopia for who? Um, because where I come from, and I'm, I wasn't born and brought up here, and I you know, moved here as an immigrant, and back in my country, you know, there are so many people who do not even know what the internet can do, right? They do not understand the internet. They might know what Facebook is, and they might go and do a little search on Facebook for you know, different things. Um, but this entire idea of, like you mentioned, cyber and uh, you know, the 90s and uh, I feel like it's it's very kind of limited mm -hmm. to uh, to certain countries and um, yeah. That's real because last I checked just a few months ago, according to Forbes, according to the global population, only 65 to 70 percent are actual internet users. That means 30 to 35 percent of the global population, which is really big, has not used the internet or does not use it actively. I, well, I was in high school in the 90s. So <laughs> a very different relationship to the internet. Um, I, immediately my brain actually went to TV because a lot of people, um, television is actually produced very differently now that we have streaming. So the, and that's because of the internet. I mean, I, I, I remember signing on to Netflix. I still got the DVDs. And, um, you know, I had to rush and put it back in the post, all that. And then, yeah, exactly, I did that too. Um, but there's a physicality that I think people feel is not, when people think of the internet, speaking of the usage globally, people also don't realize the physicality of the internet. And so, you know, there's st we're still connected by wires and fiber optic cables. And so a lot of that kind of relates to what everyone has was actually said, but, um, you know, and, and, it's, and it's interesting thinking of this kind of idea of, utopia versus dystopia, but I'm also thinking of, you know, I remember reading and was a part of co-editing this, this long form essay on prototopia. So what does it mean to always like iterate? What, what if we live in a world where we are always to kind of return to what you were saying, Mindy, about, you know, do it yourself, do with others, et cetera. But those were the things that kind of came to mind. Hey, I remember the sound the internet made when the wires were real. There's <laughs> <laughs> actually an archive of computer sounds too, if anyone's nostalgic. Um, okay, last question. Maybe it's not the best question to end on, but I'm curious. So right now we are seeing a boom in AI, similar to the boom in NFTs from 2020, right? I'm sure many people in this room have used ChatGPT for, my mom uses ChatGPT because she says it's better at Konglish, Korean, English mixed. It's really fascinating. Um, but I guess I'm curious, as technocritical people, while it might be easy to jump to criticizing AI, what do you think are some of the active potentials, especially in the, considering the social context, which makes this question much more complicated, but. <laughs> Okay, real talk. I am currently in an active fight. It seems like I'm in a fight with people in my department and program, but I'm really in a fight against the structures under which we are all oppressed and therefore have to play out these really fucked up trauma roles. It's always about the structures. It yeah. is all about the structures. And so I just decided I'm going to fight everything for, because, like, you have to. Well, I have to. So um, it's inspired by, my answer is inspired by this moment, which is I would love to use uh, AI to generate, like what kind of email response would a Karen, sorry to actual literal people named Karen, my bad. Uh, what would an actual Karen say? What would, what would, a, what would a person performing a aesthetic liberalism say in response to me pushing back against my own, you know, an experience I'm having? What would somebody say if they were being 
defensive in the most like predictable <laughs> way. Like this is the 50th person in my life who's had this response to me saying, hey, but blackness is still like at the bottom of a hierarchy in this institution. Hey, it's weird that I'm the darkest skinned person in the department. That's weird, y'all. You know, like what would, can you give me an AI that will craft that response and I can match it up to the actual emails that I get? Because you know, I would love that. What's interesting about this is ChatGPT3, the last version, was actually uh, less moderated. I mean, you might have seen that New York Times cover where they basically had it trained and asked questions about what AI would do and it said it would take over the world because all the media it's consuming, and et cetera. ChatGPT4 is scrubbed of all of this. It's very diplomatic. So I feel like if you had asked ChatGPT3 to do this type of categorization, it might have been able to, but now it might give you a quite sterilized response. Maybe that's better. Maybe that's the ins institutional response, to say nothing while saying a lot of words. No, just go ahead. I mean, one of my mentors would be really proud because I'm actually talking about my research right now. But um, because I, I <laughs> because I'm- You're writing a dissertation. I, good grief, yeah. Um, because I'm writing about voice recognition and voice cloning and things of that nature. Um, because you asked a question that really asks us to seek some type of, um, I wouldn't say optimism, but like, what is the utility? What's the use? Because- it's here to stay, so yeah, we might as well. So, exactly. Right, so a part of my research, um, because I was, um, as a part of my creative component of my dissertation, I actually created speculative kind of docu-poetics and fictions of use, incorporating chat GPT. So I thought, well, if I'm already reading through nurse triaging and 911 dispatching protocols, what would chat GPT say to certain types of emergency, whether it's domestic violence, a nosebleed, eye injury? And surprisingly, it actually matched quite similarly to actual protocols that I was reading. But take it a step further because, you know, anyone can kind of just enter something into chat GPT and then kind of, um, you know, voice it to another person or communicate the protocol itself. But one of the interviews I conducted as a part of my academic research was um, with a supervisor from the San Francisco Department of Emergency. And so I think of emergency infrastructures because when we think of abolition, there's this kind of really sticky, um, you know, uh, like contentious aspect of it, which is, well, do we get rid of an emergency system, but what about a rescue team for a missing child or a lost hiker? How do we kind of start to kind of uh, work with uh, emergency infrastructures, dispatchers, and telecommunicators, and community health workers? That actually is not about, that is framed around abolition, because I think people forget that that's very important. And the reason why I bring this up is, um, a lot of the more cosmopolitan areas, such as LA, actually LA is one of the one of the um, cities to do this. LA, I guess the city um, is they're actually incorporating um, AI technologies to assist the 911 dispatchers who, you know, are having they have to actually type everything out that is received on the call. So what they hear, they you have to someone is actually typing all of that out for documentation purposes. Um, and now they're exploring how AI can actually help the dispatcher not take over the job, but to assist so that um, they don't actually have to embody all of this uh, trauma because they are doing this. Sometimes operators will work from 12 to 14 hour shifts. And so their adrenaline is actually high the whole time, their whole shift, because you treat every call like an emergency. Even if it's a cat stuck in a tree, you have to treat everything like an emergency. So. Those are the kind of ways that I'm thinking about AI much more broadly supporting, not taking over, but supplementing the work that um, a human is given an inordinate amount of work to do, especially with that line of work. But those, that's kind of where my mind went. Yeah, and I love how you're saying like, because um, I think when you said like, oh, it's here to stay, so like, what now, right? And it's like, it's like, oh, it's, it's here to stay, but like, where should it be integrated, right? Like at the end of the day. Um, and so if we're operating under the logic of like care and, and abolition, and for us at Color Code, like um, through community definitions, where we ended up was like um, abolition technologies are technologies of love, are technologies that are life affirming. Um, and bring us care, uh, care, pleasure into our mind, body, and soul, right? Um, and so 
it might be here to stay, but where should it be integrated, right? And like that's where I um, am super inspired and love the work of so many, you know, Black and Indigenous technologies who are very critically engaging with these conversations and these questions and. Um, Color coded is also very much rooted in abolitionist like spaces, right? Like we we bring um, thinking about movements and how our movement, what kind of technologies, what kind of abolition technologies, do our movements need, uh, need so that we can integrate in places that make sense and again are towards that life affirming practice um, rather than domination control or again that logic of um, carceral technologies, aka whiteness, right? Um, but for me, going back to what Dorothy was saying, I'm like, oh, I just love the this like um, uh, like payasa traviesa vibes. Like, let's clown, like let's clown with it. Like, I wonder, like maybe that diplomatic thing was um, written out of that, out of the new version of AI, right? But like, what are the what are ways to clown with it? And like, um, for me, like I'm also like a fan of technologies not being built and not being progressed, and a lot of things that a lot of technologies that we have, like we don't, um, we don't actually need a lot of new things, right? But if we could integrate certain technologies, like we have enough technologies that we don't have to have uh, an eight-hour workday. The eight-hour workday came from the industrial revolution and all those technologies that came from there. Now with this technological revolution, right? Like, what if our work um, was four hours, et cetera, et cetera. So I think like those are more um, the ways of like integrating AI into our daily practice. But until you know our world design, until we can all agree that our world design should be based on care, um, whiteness going to be whitening and doing bullshit with um, AI. So I love um, going back to like you know the webbacks, the glitches, the the queers on the internet. It's like yeah, like let's just have fun with it then, like. Let's, yeah, be little payasos, payasos. Yeah, I want to quickly add, uh, you know, that kind of brings me back. So I'm a designer, right? And I think a lot about interaction, and especially when I'm in a, in a public space is navigating those spaces. And, uh, you know, where AI should be integrated, I think, you know, public spaces to make them more meaningful, to make them more immersive, to maybe even give context of location and placemaking. I think that's, that's something that would be really, really fruitful to see. Absolutely. Well, and I think a lot of people in this room might be designers because of Joe and Annika's classes. According to a study by OpenAI, they found that the professions most likely to be impacted by AI are having to do with math, so mathematicians, tax people, accountants, et cetera. Good. <laughs> people who are writers, screenwriters, poets, creative writers, et cetera, and also designers. And I think part of this is because some of the designs that were taught are highly templated, which is easy to be reproduced. So that doesn't mean in this idea of how can it be inserted and complement what people are doing, that almost gives us a lot of liberation to make weirder designs, right? Like I actually think this is actually a very liberating thing because we don't need to make perfect grids and guides if something can generate that for us. So what can we do to kind of offer a more human approach to this kind of thing? I think with that, we're gonna segue into a Q&A. So if anyone has any questions, we'd love to hear from you. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, whoa, no. Um, so I love, like, God, this is so inspiring. And so, like, you covered so many areas. Um, one thing I, I've been really interested in while you've been talking in this conversation around, like, the structures and, and whiteness and whatnot is the way that whiteness and capitalism overlap. And because you were talking about what happened to Gash, what happened to the glitch, what happened to all these things. Um, it, AI, uh, ChatGPT4 being more scrubbed and all that. Um, and you're talking about gatekeeping and caretaking and the differences. Uh, I'm wondering for the younger people in the audience and the students, how would you navigate or offer up opportunities to uh, 
find success in the structures that are currently present in a way that still goes against this like whiteness and the, the this oppressive structure that exists. Because it seems like all of you have found ways to be successful in spite of or because of. And I, I wonder what kind of advice you might offer these young individuals about how to navigate that. Okay, so I, I'll talk about cyborg's prosody, which is, um, you know, um, it's this kind of docu poetics piece, the TLDR version. It is a game. I call it a game. It's five levels. It's based on Elizabeth Kubler Ross's um, stages of grief, and it's about my mother and her kind of diminishing mother tongue when she immigrated, um, eight months pregnant to the U.S. in 1978. And so I interviewed her. Pretty. It was intense. It was a day long interview. I fully recorded it. There are parts in Tagalog, parts, you know, most of it's in English. But originally what I wanted to create was a, a satire of um, accent reduction schools that are rampant and a lot of this DIY, speaking of DIY material on the internet, um, that's targeted to populations that are uh, accented, not like non-dominant English accented voices. And so, I created this game um, that you have to actually, as you progress in it, you start to see more and more Tagalog words and phrases. And then by the time you get to level five, everything is in Tagalog. Do you know what you're saying? No, you have to trust me as the artist, as the writer, that you know the ludic experience or the kind of whatever incentive you you feel that you'll you'll get at the end is is worth it, so to speak. And just kind of a spoiler is that. The, the reward is that you see everything in English at the end, but you have to mimic the cyborg, which is a Filipino accented voice. And it's funny, you know, thinking about uh, my younger self doing something like this, because I have been confronted. I have actually given a presentation about cyborgs prostate to a room full of white, cis, straight male engineers who thought the game was racist, who said, um, what is it gonna teach me, you know, mimicking this voice? Um, what, what, and some of them thought it was a product. Like, well, why are you making this product? It's like people of Duolingo has already done this. I'm like, well, okay, they invite me to be a visiting scholar, so whatever. Um, anyway, my point in saying this is usually when I would respond to this is, is because it doesn't center whiteness. It is because this, this actually decenters familiarity for you. And also, how do you learn language? You mimic. So this kind of docu-poetics approach, which is essentially storytelling, but legibility in academia is very important to some people. But um, you know, my advice in telling kind of that, that story of how cyborg's prosody came to be is I had to go back to what I know and what I've seen and what I've witnessed. I have been through um, being an artist, designing things that I thought people might like. I cared so much about what other people will like. And I, the older I got, the more art I made, I realized I don't care what people think. If this isn't for you, then it's not for you. And I don't mind the antagonism. I clearly don't, because I, I, I'm okay with antagonizing open source. Trust me, I totally am. Um, but I think that's one of the things that I would say to, you know, even my own students, you know, you, 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 you're, you're, you're being blocked creatively because you think you want to make something for that's that pleases other people, but we don't live in that world. You know, we you know it's like you got to just make the thing that speaks to you. And um, I know that sounds very like I just said everything and nothing at all, but it's very true. You you know you when you make something so close to where you're at. Um, you will meet people that will meet you where you're at and, and also expand upon and vice versa. You know, it's very, it, it very much is a huge part of my own practice. Yeah, I'm like, tear. <laughs> um, I'm so glad you went with the expressive and poetic because I'm going with the Capricorn, hard Capricorn, I need comfort, I need some money, yo, like, I need it. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. So how do I tell this in a short way? Dorothy, when you said um, making things that please people, but we don't live in that world, I was like, oh, yeah, because nobody's happy. So that's not going to work. <laughs> but I mean, look at, yeah, true, right? Um, everything that Dorothy said is right, and I co sign that. I will also say that it is a lesson, and you can learn it quickly, or you can spend a bunch of years learning it the hard way. Make the thing that you want to make based on who you are and what you know and know your positionality because this advice, what the specificity is of that choice differs whether you are a able-bodied, straight, cis, white male versus none of those things. And I want to be really clear because what often happens in a, in a society of aesthetic liberalism where we feel like we cannot fail, where we feel like we're afraid to say the wrong thing, where we cannot learn because we're like, no, never make the mistake because I don't want to get canceled, which is extremely toxic. Um, it means that oftentimes we stop with that sense of guilt or self-consciousness instead of actually being like, you know what, I have privilege. And instead of hiding that or, or hiding my power, and I mean the, both for those who, who appear to be at the position um, at the top of a hierarchy and those of us who, who are so used to being victims that we maybe don't recognize when we have power. When we don't recognize the power that our degrees confer, our institutions or these stamps or our residencies or what have you. Okay, this is also gonna be expressive and poetic. You have to know yourself and who you are, which is a work, because you have to recognize your, your positionality, because you have to recognize your power so that you can use it, because your tactics will shift and they have to shift. And this is why I love even the term cyber feminism, right? Because it's never going to be static. And that is the world that you live in where you have to adapt. You have to actually, first of all, some of you are like, I don't have any power. Okay, I'm on student loans, I'm living in a shitty place, and like I just need to get a job. And I respect that, and that is valid, and get that job. Do not go out to be a freedom fighter when you are eating ramen and you cannot pay rent. Okay, take that job. The moment that you have some comfort, the moment that your nervous system is regulated, the moment that you have some power and privilege and people are starting to call you and offer you money and, oppor and opportunities, you have to check in again and say, am I still that same victimized person? If you ever were. And if not, I don't believe in hoarding power. I used to say this about empathy. When I was in grad school, I came to this conclusion. I said, you know, if you have empathy, you have to spend it. You can't hoard it. You know, whatever, whatever empathy you have for yourself, use it on yourself. And as soon as you're good, you gotta, you gotta use that for other people. Now I don't actually believe in empathy, power. Don't hoard power. If you have power, how can it be used? So an example, in the form of a story. Uh, I spent the last two weeks of March in London working for two different brands who impact, whose like global reach is individually billions and billions of people. The work that I was doing that I can't tell you about, that I got paid quite nicely for, is going to impact in whatever way billions of freaking people. And when I think about that, when I think about that success, I think about a certain kind of success, a certain kind of capitalist success, a certain kind of access that allows me to pay my rent. Um, I think about when I was a student and all the way till now, I told you I'm fighting in my department. I have tenure, so I can fight. I have tenure, so I now I can actually push and say, you know what? Not only do I have tenure, I have other opportunities outside of the institution, so I don't have to worry so much about that job. I don't have to worry so much about if I if I support a labor strike and if my pay is gonna get docked. Because I don't, and I will never rely on any independent institution. People are like, you got tenure, great. I was like, I don't care, I have tenure, box check, let me go do some other shit. So I always diversify my portfolio of opportunities. So that's one thing. I think if you can do that, you should do it. And then, this is what I really wanna say. I am fighting now, and I've been fighting since the beginning. When I went to UCLA, I was trying so hard just to fit in, okay? I was so excited to be accepted to a prestigious university that I did not feel like I deserved to be in, that I did not think I belonged in. I did not think I didn't have money. I wasn't like the other people. I didn't know how to dress. I was made fun of. It was a whole thing. And then I, what I learned was that I was so different that I was never going to be able to fade into the background. It just wasn't going to fucking happen. So I had to own that, and I had to learn to fight. I had to learn to use my voice. And they told me back then, so many people would say, because I'm a person who will reply all, oh, that's just me. If you mess with me, you're going to get the whole, everybody's going to know about it. I'm not going to be quiet about that. 
he would say, Aaliyah, back then I was Aaliyah, Aaliyah, well, we agree with what you're saying, but you gotta be tactful. You gotta read the room, you gotta do this. And what I learned is that oftentimes when people were telling me that what I was saying was correct, but I was saying it the wrong way, they were saying that because it was working. They were saying that because it was effective. And I will say, this has been 12 years going, I am still undefeated. So I don't know what's happening in my department right now, but they don't know. They don't know that I am used to, and many of us are used to being told no, are used to being overlooked, are used to being shut down. And I say, keep it going. I, I will tell you that one of the reasons I have power is because I always have my own platforms. People are like, you're using social media and you're saying things on Twitter that are true about your experience. And I'm like, yeah, and that Twitter account was before I was at this institution. And that Twitter account is how I got the job. And that open letter I wrote about the founder of Oculus being a white supremacist is how I got on the map of so many of these people. So what I'm trying to tell you is that your voice, no matter how many people are telling you to be quiet, they're telling you to be quiet because it's making them uncomfortable. But there, you are not always speaking to the person you're speaking to. You're speaking so that others can hear. And even though we live in a fucked up capitalist society, most people, most people, the vast majority of people, well, probably 99% of the people, minimum, are not happy with how things are. And all of those people work in different companies. Some of them are doing the best they can starting DEI initiatives that you want to scoff at. Some of them are just like, oh, I saw a brown front person. I want to have a black friend. And you're like, okay, they're there. But a lot of people mean well, and those people work in all sorts of places. And sometimes that person will work at a corporation that you think you despise, and they'll actually be more welcoming and comforting and support you more than the glossy liberal institution that you know will put your picture on a, on a banner. So with all the shit that you're going to go through, don't chase the people or the spaces that make you feel shitty recognize and hear the people in the spaces that are lifting you up. Because sometimes we get lost. If you're like me, you can codependent trauma cycles. You get lost chasing and obsessing the people who you're like, they don't accept me. They don't accept me. They don't accept me. Okay, fuck them. And then go and, 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 and look at your peers because those people are also getting older. Those people are also getting jobs. Those people are also, me and Mindy went to school together. Like <laughs> stick with your peers. Like you don't actually have to settle, but everything in this world tells all of us that we have to play out these fucked up roles. You don't have to. And you'll find that lots of other people, they're like, oh shit, there's another way. Well, let's get on a panel. That's my advice. To quickly add on to Am's point, I'll also say, as you're doing this sort of climb, we go back to the question of do it yourself or do it with others. I think the people in this room, some of the people I work closest with now are people I met in school, right? Whether you're struggling or doing well or not, you're finding your lifelong collaborators now. So I do think a huge part of this is work your hardest to get these resources now with others. And then when you are in a position of power, redistribute as much as possible. Like when I get asked to do talks, I ask to see who's on the roster and if it's it doesn't look as balanced as I'd want. I give them suggestions for peers or contemporaries that should be on that stage. So I think that you have a lot of leeway, as AM is saying, once you kind of move through all of these, these hurdles, and that's made much easier when you're part of a collective. Yeah, and um, to follow the poetic prose, I would also just say, like, reiterate in the same way what we're saying, know yourself. Like, also know your people, know who your people are, right? So to, to that extent. Um, and I became an abolitionist organizer because like, I don't believe in reformist reforms or I don't believe in being active in those spaces, right? Um, but that comes with a lot of risk. It does mean that like, oh, sometimes I don't know how I'm gonna pay my rent, <laughs> like shit, you know? And knowing myself and knowing what risk I can take um, is part of that process, right? And knowing how I want to spend my energy. Because maybe, uh, you know, I work, I might work in academia, but where you're really spending your energy and doing your work is, okay, use your acad academia paycheck, but you're really talking to the people and holding circles, and those are your people. That's who you're accountable to, right? So I would say, who, you're, who are you accountable to? because uh, like in Color Coded, we were a little bit, 
like uh, when we first started back in 2015, folks weren't really saying tech is not neutral. Like that wasn't the mainstream thing that you were getting. And um, actually coming from uh, like STEM pipelines, right? Like there's a lot of youth um, from communities of color, uh, uh, youth of color, right? From working class backgrounds who were targeted into this tech pipeline. And, we, and at Color Code, we were like, don't, don't do that. Like people would come to us and be like, oh, like let's get your training so I can enter into this tech pipeline. And we'd be like, don't, don't do it. Like we'll tell you now, like you're gonna be up, a, up against whiteness culture. And a lot of migrant, as a migrant, I was told like, if you enter those spaces, if you're going to these institutions, you're succeeding, right? But that wasn't success to me because it actually made me center whiteness and I've been healing from those spaces. I've been healing from being in a predominantly white institution and remembering myself and remembering my people. Um, so for at Color Code, we would just be like, just don't do it. Like as an organizer, be rooted in your power, be rooted in your community power and build the spaces that you want to see, right? Like build, build many worlds, knowing that um, what might work in your world is not what's gonna work in someone else's world. But if you're giving folks the tools and making spaces for those tools to be used, then maybe we would have a lot of spaces where we don't have to compromise, where, we, where there are spaces and infrastructure built around centered care. So it doesn't have to be as risky to not enter into these other spaces. So I would say don't do it and you know, find your own way, be yourself and create the things that you want to do and that you want to see for yourself and for your community. I think we're at, I we're at time for this space. Okay, thank you so much. What a, what a, thank you so much. What a lively discussion. Um, thank you again so much to Joe and Southland and Cal State LA. Uh, we'll continue this informally. So yeah, thank you so much again for coming. And to our amazing panelists too. Really appreciate it. Great. Yes, thank you all so much. I'm sorry to feel like we're ending things as they're taking off. Um, but yeah, we can continue the conversation outside. Um, but there's sort of, a, for you guys couldn't see it on stage, but we had our captioner tonight was not an AI, but a live person who sort of announced captioner needs to sign off at the scheduled time. <laughs> sort of an interesting uh, human reminder of our, uh, position and boundaries, yes. Um, but thank you all again, this was amazing. Thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, we have some books. If you wanna stick around and chat outside, please do so. Uh, and yeah, check out the book, check out the website. Um, and thank you again, everyone for being here.